Sharing the good news with Mormons. I need this. Chapter 21, when being good is not good enough. This is perfect. This is God-ordained. There is not a person who I would rather have followed than my buddy, friend, and if they ever outlaw Christianity, he'll be my first partner in crime, <laughs> Keith. So um, thanks for setting this up. I'm your warm-up man. <laughs> there. Okay. Must be kind to everyone. More than anything else, your kindness tells me that you care. And I've experienced that this week. I've had people invite me over to talk. I've had people invite me out to lunch. Um, I've had people tell me how IRR has impacted their lives and their ministry. I've experienced a lot of amazing caring during this week. But also, expressing kindness and letting people know you care is important because when I know you care, then what you say to me matters. And when what you say matters to me, then I'm going to listen. And I'm not only going to listen, I'm going to remember what you said. And there's a really good chance if what you had for me was something that I should take action on, I'm going to do that. Why? Because you're no longer a stranger. You've become at some level a friend. This is why 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26 is like the theme verse for our ministry. It's become kind of a theme verse for my own personal ministry. It, it just nails us and especially what's been going on these last two weeks here. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone. Now, there have been times I wish that word wasn't in the scripture, that everyone, because when it says everyone, it means everyone. That means the Mormon that's given me a hard time, that is being obnoxious or cynical. Um, it can be the Jehovah's Witness who is lying through their teeth when I'm challenging them on something. Kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents, and we have them, must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. And the people that we're interacting with and dealing with, this is them and this is us. So I have street prayers. I don't know if you guys have street prayers, but I have certain street prayers. I'm just going to share some of them with you. Um, the first one I try to remember is this. God, give me your heart for this person. When I'm tired, when I'm feeling frustrated, when I'm feeling like nothing is working, and that's happened a few times this week for me, and I've been doing this for over 30 years. So if any of you have felt like, man, I'm just not getting a conversation. This is just like, I'm like in this little cement box and everybody else is outside. I've been there. So you're not alone. Um, God, give me your heart for this person because God has a heart for the people we want to reach. Second, God, give me your words because I don't have any of my own. And I don't know if you've been there, but I've been there many times. And that's a good prayer rather than babbling or pray that and see what God brings to mind. And then the other prayer that I've prayed on the street is this. God, be merciful and grant repentance to this person. Because I know if God doesn't grant repentance, repentance is a gift, just like grace, salvation, eternal life that God grants. And I was really praying those prayers um, a few years ago when... A uh, taxi driver, I was in Peru, was there for the Mormon temple opening, and one of the main churches that was sponsoring me was setting up conferences and media interviews because the Mormons were opening a temple in their city in Trujillo. Um, they said, hey, we want to help you out. We've got a brother in the church. He's a taxi driver, and he would love to kind of be your chauffeur. So if you've got to go to an interview, if you've got to go to a meeting with a pastor, you want to get somewhere, he's kind of on call for you. And I'm like, great. Now, you do have to pay him. Okay, well, I expect that. Not expecting to run me around the city for free. But this guy was amazing. Well, about the second day we're running around together, he says, hey, Joel, you know a lot about Mormonism, right? I said, yeah, 30 years, I've learned a few things. He said, would you come meet with my mom? I said, your mom? Yeah, my mom became a Mormon about 10 or 12 years ago. She's pretty old. I'm really concerned. I just, I don't know how to talk to her. I have no idea what to say, but I'd really like it if you'd come talk to her. No pressure, right? <laughs> so I said, uh, 
Yeah, yes, I will. If it works with the schedule, I've got a really busy schedule, but God opens the door for the schedule. And if your mother is willing to talk to me, knowing who I am and what this is all about, I said, because I am not going to be deceptive. Um, I'm not going to play games. I'm not going to pretend to be somebody I'm not. But if she, you know, if she's willing to talk to me and knows that, hey, here's a guy who's here. He knows a lot about Mormonism. I mean, you don't have to tell her that I'm a rabid anti-Mormon and I'm going to, you know, but let her know. And I'm thinking, it's not going to happen. There's no way this lady is going to. Two days later, Joel, she can meet Thursday, four o'clock. Can you come? I'll come pick you up. I'm like, let me see what I've got. It's open. I have nothing that whole afternoon. It's like, okay. So then my street prayers go into effect, right? Because I don't know this lady. I don't know where she's coming from. I don't know what kind of Mormon she is. So we get to her house and I just start with my usual questions, which are, so, and some of it's just, you know, what do you like about Peru? You know, I love the food, love the language. I'm fluent in Spanish, so this really helps the situation. I grew up in Venezuela, South America. I'm a missionary kid, so totally comfortable with the culture. But after a little bit of small talk, I finally say, so, you know, when did you become a Mormon? It's like 10, 12 years ago. Well, what caused you to go? And I said, what was your religious background before that? She says, oh, I was kind of nominal Roman Catholic, didn't practice a lot. Pretty typical for Latin America. So, so what interested you in Mormonism? What made you decide to convert? Well, I was just at home doing nothing. The Mormon missionaries come over and they're like really nice and they're like great guys. And they're telling me about their church and, and they're saying I could come and that there'd be stuff I could do. And they're telling me about, so I really liked it. I liked them and so I got baptized. And they've given me all this cool stuff to do. So I just, I kind of have a place. Now at that point, I'm thinking, okay, this woman probably doesn't even know who Brigham Young is because her connection with Mormonism is not theological or historical. It is purely social and emotional. They have stepped into met a need. So if I step in and I try to explain all the variances with the first vision, if I try to talk about Joseph Smith's polygamy, if I, if I go through any of that stuff, she's not going to care. It's not going to be relevant to her Mormon experience. So I'm saying, okay, God, what does she need? And um, what God made really clear was she needs to hear the most basic New Testament message, which is repent and believe. But here's the thing. There can be no true repentance from sin until there is a deep conviction of sin. I'm going to say that again because it may be the most important thing that I say today. There can be no true repentance from sin until there is a deep conviction of sin. And my experience of over 30 years studying, interacting, loving on, mentoring Mormons, ex-Mormons, transitioning Mormons is this. Within the Mormon church, there is very little deep conviction of sin. Um, so, why does repentant, why repentance matters? Well, here's why. An unrepentant Mormon, no matter how sincere they are, is still a lost Mormon. And an unrepentant ex-Mormon, no matter how much he or she rejects Mormonism, is still a lost ex-Mormon. If they haven't repented, they are still as distant from God, they're just as separate as they've ever been. And if Mormonism should crumble and there's no cross for them to cling to, the Mormon or the ex-Mormon will cling to the only thing they've got, which is themselves. Which is why I think such a high percentage of Mormons go into atheism or agnosticism because once they don't have Mormonism, they don't have Jesus to go to. And so they're just continuing to rely on who they are and what they can provide and what they can find. So for me, key to all this is person first, Mormon second. What I mean? Well, because a Mormon is a person first and a Mormon second, their main problem is not Mormonism. Now, it's a big part of the problem, but because a Mormon is a person, their biggest problem is what? It's their sin. It's their separation from God. So when we interact with Mormons, it's very important to take into account their Mormonism because their Mormonism colors what they see, how they react, how they view scripture. But a Mormon's main problem is not his Mormonism, it's his pride and it's his self-reliance. Um, he's got this. He is secure in what he thinks, many of them, not all of them. Now, Mormonism is simply the environment that allows a person to be proud, self-reliant, 
and unrepentant and religious all at the same time. It simply gives them a place where they can be who they are and still feel good about themselves because they're religious. They're doing stuff. They are working hard to earn their own way. And this is kind of where this Peruvian lady was. As I talked to her, she's like, fine. She has no sense of an issue with God. She's one of God's children. She was born a child of God. She's just trying to be the best child of God she can be. And you know, when she dies, she's just figuring, hey, Jesus will make up. So there is no sense of spiritual need as I'm talking to this lady. So where do I want to go as I talk to a Mormon? I want to go to commandment keeping. Why? Because Mormons are big on commandment keeping. Um, in fact, commandment keeping is the rich soil that allows pride to flourish. And I don't care what religion you're in. Show me a good legalist. Show me a person who's following rules and thinks they're doing well. And I'll show you a person who's by and large arrogant, condescending, judgmental. And that doesn't matter. Why? Because commandment keeping appeals to our pride. So most Mormons have a love-hate relationship with the commandments. Uh, it's kind of like they can't live without the commandments, but they can't live with them. And Keith has explained a little bit about that. In fact, in my chapter in the book, I have a footnote referencing his chapter because I didn't want to have to go in um, to all of it. So, so here's Mormons end up on two sides of the spectrum. And you can usually figure this out as you're talking to a Mormon. On the one side, Mormons who are liking the commandments, they feel like they're doing it. So when they can stay superficial, when they can focus on simply doing things like not drinking tea or coffee, having their home evening, paying their tithing, um, observing the Sabbath, um, then when they feel successful, they feel great as Mormons. I've talked to Mormons. They are so satisfied. They are so happy. They gush. Um, with how great Mormonism has been for them. Um, and often they're arrogant, condescending, and judgmental. And their attitude is, I've got this. I don't need your religion. I don't need to talk about any of this. Now, the flip side of that is the Mormon who's really tried hard, who maybe does take the commandment seriously. And when they're deeply honest, when they've worked hard and they feel like they're failing, then what they're feeling is just the opposite. They're feeling despair, frustration, shame, resignation. And many Mormons will get to the point where they just go, why bother? Why try? Now, unfortunately, if they don't have an alternative, then everything just goes. So how do you awaken an awareness of sin? In other words, if what a Mormon needs is to come to a deep conviction of his own sinfulness so he can truly repent, then how do we do that? Well, key to conviction, which leads to true repentance, is a deep awareness of that sinfulness. And Mormon commandment keeping is a natural door opener. Why? Because I have not yet met a Mormon who didn't think commandment keeping wasn't important. And so this is kind of the direction I went with this LDS lady. Um, and I just said, so there's a lot of stuff you have to do, right? What is it that, um, why is it important to keep the, is it important to keep the commandments? And the answer is almost always yes. Now, a good follow-up question to that is why? Ask the Mormon, why is it important to keep the commandments? And let them answer. They may have a number of, but I can pretty much guarantee you their answer to why it's important to keep the commandments is going to open the door for things further in the conversation. And then a good follow-up question to the why, after they tell you why it's so important, is to make it a little more personal and say, so how are you doing with that? How are you doing with your commandment keeping? Now, again, here, you may get one of a couple different answers. You may get someone who says, hey, it's, it's going great. I'm doing it. I'm following it. It's working. I mean, I'm not perfect. Of course, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But, you know, I just have to do my best, and Jesus is just going to make up the rest for me. You know, so I'm just trying my hardest. I'm doing the best that I can. And then, you know, I'll have 100 million years if I need to to finish this thing up. Um, so... Now, at that point, if you get that kind of answer, it can be really tempting to immediately jump into the impossible gospel. And I'm going to encourage you to not do that. Here's why. It's a little premature because at this point, they don't have a sense of need. And if all you do is try to grab a technique and immediately beat them down or tell them they're wrong, because at this point, who have you been talking to? A Mormon or a person who happens to be a Mormon? 
You've been talking to a person who happens to be a Mormon. This is all very personal. There's no attack, and there's probably very little defensiveness. Um, so what I like to do is, no matter what they say, and sometimes they may say, well, you know, I'm trying. I'm probably not doing really well. I just hope God's going to be merciful, and, you know, I'm hoping, you know, to try harder in the future. A question that I have wanted to ask, and I'm really kind of bummed at this point. I, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I have struggled during this Manti um, it, it, there's been some great conversations. I feel like God's been in it. But my agenda obviously wasn't God's agenda because I wanted to have like two or three good conversations where I ran through this whole thing with people because I had some of these new questions I wanted to try. I never got to do it once. Not once. And um, I'll talk a little bit more of that later. But this is the question that I wanted to ask, which is, is it possible to keep the commandments and walk away from the Savior? Now, so here's the deal. I'm giving you guys the question. So I'm leaving today. After this is done, I've got another meeting in Salt Lake City, and then I fly out. So I don't get to use the question in Manti. I'm giving it to you. So if you get a chance to use this, I would love it if at least one person would ask a Mormon this. Why? Where does it lead? Well, for me, where I want to go with this, and I talk about this in my chapter, is I want to go to Matthew 19, 16 with the rich young ruler. Because if you ask a Mormon, is it possible to keep the commandments and walk away from the Savior? I can't imagine a Mormon who's going to say, that that's going to happen because keeping the commandments is being with the Savior. It's what you're following his example. So Matthew 19, 16, 22, what do we have? The rich young ruler in Jesus. He's the one who comes and says, good master, what do I need to do to have eternal life? I, that's all of our question, right? That's every Mormon's question. So Jesus says, well, you know, why do you call me good? But Jesus switches what? The conversation to the commandments. Do you know the commandments? Yes. And he mentions the big ones, you know, don't lie, steal, murder, commit adultery, those things. And how does the guy respond? All of these I have kept since my youth. He was doing the commandment thing. Now, Jesus doesn't say, you are such an arrogant pride. You have no idea. Don't you know that if you look with lust on a woman with your heart, you committed adultery? Don't you know that if you've been angry at someone said raka to your brother, it's the same as murdering them? What, what's your problem? You have no idea what commandment. Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he takes the positive route. He goes, hey, great. So there's only one more thing you need. And I'm sure at this point the guy's like, yes, all the commandment keeping was worth it. I got one more thing and I'm in. And so Jesus says, all you got to do is what? Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And you're in. And the guy goes, oh, yay, hooray, that is so easy, I'm doing it, I'm in, great. No, says he walks away sad. What happened? For all his commandment keeping, he'd still failed to keep the first and greatest, most important commandment, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. What was Jesus doing? He was putting his finger on the commandment keeping that wasn't working because what would have shown his love for God? Hey, giving up his money right away. Hey, if you want me to follow you, I'm in. Love for your neighbor. Give the money to the poor. Um, so he went away sad. So can you keep the commandments and walk away from the Savior? Absolutely, yes. We've got a biblical example. And um, so other questions kind of follow up with Mormons. If you get a chance, and you can just share the story like I did. And it's really kind of fun. Um, so the question to ask is, was God impressed with this man's commandment keeping? The answer is No. He went away sad. Why not? And again, let them answer. And there could be any number of answers, but take time to listen. Because what this is letting you do is it's letting you get to know the Mormon. You're still what? Person to person. Mormonism has not even come into the discussion at this point. So a key question is this. Would you agree that sin is what keeps us separated from God the Father? My experience is the great majority of people, and especially Mormons, would agree. Yeah, sin, man, that's what messes us up. So, have you ever looked objectively at your own sin? Have you ever taken the sum of your sins? Now, most of the time, if you ask that question, you get a blank look. That's good. You want the blank look. It means they have no idea what you're talking about. And anytime someone has no idea what you're talking about, you have the advantage. Why? Because they're waiting for you to explain. So, um, I asked this Peruvian lady this. I said, so, have you ever taken an objective look? She agreed. Her sin is what would separate her from God. I said, well, would you mind if we kind of looked at the sum of your sins? Because it's, it'd be good to know how much sin actually is there that separates us from God. And so what I did is I walked her through this. Um, and so I said, let's start with a child at age five. And starting at age five, let's say the kid only commits four sins per day. 
Now with the Mormon, they may throw out, well, you know, kids don't hit the age of accountability for sin until eight. But I'm sorry, they still know their kids' sin. In fact, who was it? Oh, I was talking to Trisha last night, who's a former Mormon, and I was, we were talking a little bit about this, and she goes, oh man, I was so afraid of the age of accountability, because I knew then my sins would start to count against me. She said, but I still, it didn't stop me from thinking when I was seven, I got one year to be mean to my brother. <laughs> um, so, four sins per day, that's not a lot. I mean, I had eight kids, okay? So I got to see a lot of sin take place, and my kids started sinning way before age five. Now, it wasn't super serious, it wasn't a big deal, but four sins per day is not hard. So four sins per day, five days per week, why? There's seven days in a week, but we're given weekends free from sin. We don't wanna be exaggerated. So that's 20 sins per week. So 20 per week, 50 weeks per year. Now I know there's 52, but again, we don't want this to be an exaggerated number. So everybody gets two weeks vacation from sin, just automatically. Um, so that's a thousand sins per year. So from age five to nine, you accumulate 5,000 sins. No big deal, they're not real serious. Um, but now ages 10 to 14, it gets a little more serious. So four sins per day, no way. My kids had four sins out of the way before lunchtime, easily. So we're gonna say eight sins per day. Again, the five days per week, we're giving them their weekends free, and that's 40. 40 per week, 50 weeks per year. Once you start giving vacation, everybody knows you can't take it away, it doesn't work. Still the same two weeks vacation. That's now 2,000 sins per year. So from the ages of 10 to 14, the next five-year block, you've accumulated an additional 10,000 sins. And again, you may get some, and I just go, so really, we're, we're fine, we're fine. Because um, I wanna get to age 15 to 19, why? Okay, because this is where it kinda gets serious. Everybody knows teenagers are like sin experts. <laughs> um, they just know, how, they're so creative. My kids were so creative with sin, it was amazing. I didn't have to teach them anything. They came up with stuff on their own. So eight sins per day, no way. Um, eight sins sometimes before breakfast with some of them. That wasn't often, but so 16 sins per day. We're, we're going to leave it at 16. That's not an exorbitant number. Five days per week again. We're giving them nights and weekends free. I know that's the most sinful time, but still. Um, 80 sins per week, 50 weeks per year. Teenagers get their vacation too. So we're now we're at 4,000 sins per year. So age 15 to 19, you've accumulated an additional 20,000 sins. Now, with her, because I knew she was in her 70s, I went one step further. And I said, now, you know teenagers can be bad, but I don't know about you, but my kids are like into their you know, college years, and sometimes it really, but I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to keep it at 16 per day, and I know the sins get worse, but let's just do another five years at the 16 sins per day, which is an additional um, 20,000 sins. So... I said, let's add this up. And I usually have a piece of paper and napkin or something because I'm drawing this out. I'm writing this out as I can. And so we add it up. Five to nine, 5,000 sins. 10 to 14, 10,000. 15 to 19, 20,000. Um, 20 to 24, an additional 20,000. So with her, I said, so what that means is you and I both have got 55,000 sins on our ledger before age 25. And no kidding, her response was this. Under her breath, she goes, I. Estoy condenada, which in Spanish means, oh man, I'm condemned. And that's exactly what we want a person to feel. And immediately she wanted to change the conversation. So, and I gave her about 35, 40 seconds. And I brought her back because um, I said, this is important. And now the next questions, because at this point now, it's been happy. I mean, you guys have been laughing. This is what happens. You're, you can joke around. You can have a lot of fun with this. This is very personal. And people are relating. But then the question is this. Okay, you got these 55,000 sins, even if it's 35,000. How many of those are confessed? How many of those do you even remember to confess them? And I met um, one of our former board members and a good friend, Ron Huggins, who's done a lot of research. He's just a brilliant um, guy in Salt Lake City. I uh, met him for lunch, and no way. Okay, well, this is going to be fast. Um, anyway, what he said to me is, Joel, it's not only that. It's not only the ones that you don't remember. What about the ones you do remember you can't forget? What about those sins that you know you've committed that have been devastating? There's no way you can make reconciliation totally happen. There's no way you can repair the damage. He said, those are the sins that haunt me 
that knowing those are on my ledger really emphasize that. Man, that's great. That needs to be included. So it's not in the book, but you guys have got it here. Write it in the margin if you need to. So let's go through this really quickly. So um, making it personal. Do you think this is true of you as it is of me? With that much sin on the ledger, could you ever do enough good works to tip the scales in your favor? And since God the Father is perfect, we need to be perfect to live in his presence. Do you think you could ever do enough to offset a life of accumulated sin? And pick any one of these, any variation. The idea is what we want to do is we want to take this and make this personal to the Mormon. Because at this point, they're getting it. But now we want to drive this home. Why? Because without a deep conviction of sin, there can't be repentance. And without repentance, there can't be true faith. So I'm going to flip through these last ones here. The diagnostic question. And this is where I want to bring it to some variation of this, which is, if there were a way to get rid of every sin you've ever committed or will commit so you could stand permanently perfect before God the Father, would you want to know about it? Now, if I don't get a really clear yes at this point, I don't go much further. Mm -hmm. I am not going to share a solution to a problem they don't have. And people may disagree with me on that, but my personal experience has been, if I don't have a person who's really in, they're in tune with this, they're feeling it, and when I ask this, if they don't say, um, yeah, because what about you? What have you done with all your sin? You know, are you perfect? My answer is always, yes, I am perfect. Now, you may get, oh, yeah, come on, really, because I've talked about my sin in the course of the conversation. I said, well, here's the deal. My ledger has zero sin. And my ledger is going to stay at zero until the day I die and I meet Heavenly Father face to face. But it can be true of you. Do you want to know how? And again, if I don't get a yes to that, I'll leave it there. Very often, though, people will say yes. So what do you do? Well, um, the solution is a double exchange. And I'm going to just throw these up here. The key to salvation and the key to grace is we trade our sin for the perfect righteousness of Christ. It is a double transfer, it is a double trade, it's a double exchange, whatever term you want to use. But the verses that highlight this are 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. 24 says, He himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin, live to righteousness. Our sin, his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he the Father made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. Why? Why would God the Father make his perfect son sin? so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The only righteousness that's going to work for us before Heavenly Father is the righteousness of Jesus that we get credit for. And then the who, the what, and the how of justification. I um, love this verse because it covers everything. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive. So that's the who, you and God. God made alive together with him, Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. What's going on here? God is taking the big sign, the, the court condemnation document that says guilty, that's on your chest. And he's saying, you know what? I'm taking that guilty marker because you stand guilty. You stand under the wrath. And you know what I'm going to do with it? I'm going to take it. And I've taken this guilty and I'm putting it right here. My son bears your guilt, your shame, everything for you so you don't have to. And unless that happens, people stay in their sins. So it's been nailed to the cross. And you can develop this more for time. Um, I just want to get to these last couple of slides. So it's already been said a couple of times. It can't be emphasized enough. Terms must be defined. Mormons understand mercy, grace, faith, and gift totally different than we as believers do. And so at this point, or at some point, it's good to say, even ask, how do you understand it? But help them say, in this context, mercy is not getting the punishment I deserve. That, that guilty verdict that was nailed to my chest that I bore because of that, all that accumulated sin, mercy is that I don't get the punishment for that I deserve. Grace is undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor, the getting of something good I don't deserve. That's the forgiveness and eternal life. What is faith? Faith is believing God will do what he says. Faith is believing that when you come to God with open, empty hands, oh, they're not empty, actually, hands with your 35,000 sins, that's all you have to offer to God. When you bring that to God, God said, you know what? I'll trade. I'll really trade you all that sin for the righteousness of my son. 
If you don't believe God will really do that, you won't. And a Mormon has to come to the place where he has faith that God will do what he said he'll do. And then finally, a gift, something freely given and freely received. The more undeserved the gift, the more humility required to accept it. Because what is a Mormon's key problem? It's not his Mormonism. It's his pride and it's his self-reliance. And until he's willing to humbly lay that aside, he won't accept the gift. And only God's work in his heart is going to do that. So what do we need to do? Last two things here. For us to be effective, we need to retune our heart to reveal Jesus. And why do I, why do I say retune? Well, I play guitar, um, do worship team for our church, and it doesn't matter how often I've tuned my guitar. Every time I go to take it out to play for rehearsal or for church, what do I do? Anybody who plays guitar? You retune, right? Nobody takes their guitar out of their case and stands up to play without checking to see if it's in tune. Why? It goes out of tune. By nature, the strings, we do too. By nature, because we're fallen, broken people, we go out of tune. We have to retune. How do we do that? I've got four things. Embrace your inability to change anyone's heart. Okay? You don't get to change a heart. You can't do it. That pressure's off. Second, embrace your ability to show love to anyone you meet. That you can do. No Mormon on the streets of Manti or Ephraim or anywhere can keep you from showing love to them. You get to love on them. They may not accept it. They may resent it. They may bristle. But you've still shown them love. Third, reject the desire to win or make it about you or feel good about yourself. Okay, this was mine last night. Driving home from Manti, I was bummed because I was done. I was going to come talk today, and I didn't have a fresh example about how I got to use my technique and bring 25 people to Christ on the streets of Manti. I don't think I was expecting 25, but, you know, even one would have been nice. And I'm struggling with this, and it's like God saying, Joel, your presentation, duh, is not about you. You don't think I used you? You don't think I had a plan for you? You think I just somehow totally messed this up because you didn't get to do what you wanted to do? I'm like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. You know, retune my heart. Fortunately, you know, I had to drive home from Manti last night, so I can do some heart retuning so I can stand up here before you guys. But that, that'll be hard, and you guys are going to feel that. Anybody in ministry feels that from time to time. And we have to go back to, it's not about me. It's not about winning. It's not about feeling good about me. Because there's times you're just plain not going to feel good about you. Right, Chip? <laughs> All right, last slide. Um, if nothing else, remember these four things. And seriously, this is the last slide. Being kind to Mormons is not an option, it's an imperative. We have to be kind to everyone. You never have an excuse to be mean or cynical or short or angry with a Mormon. You just, you just don't. You don't. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't do it, but it's not an option. It's an imperative. Second, there can be no true repentance from sin until there is a deep conviction of sin. So we want to help Mormons come to that deep conviction of their own sinfulness. Third, God is able to do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. So let's boldly ask and imagine, people. I mean, I've done, that's one of the things I have done this week. Say, God, you can do it, but you're waiting for me to ask and imagine. So let's do it. Let's, in these last couple of days at Manti, let's boldly ask for God to move. Let's imagine things happening and know that he can do way beyond what we could ever do or think. And finally, I love you guys. Um, I just, I love being, it's been a lot of years since I've been in Manti, and I was so looking forward to this, and that did not disappoint. Um, so yeah, I may be disappointed in like what I got to do, but in terms of you guys, so um, you all have touched and encouraged my heart this week, and I just want to say, these last couple of days, go forth with God in his blessing and his power. Vayan con Dios. Thanks. Thanks.